We're in a series called Jesus Changes Everything. And a couple weeks ago, we looked at the character of Thomas. Last week, we looked at religious leaders, different characters who were forever changed because of the Easter story. We're going to end up in Mark chapter 15 today. If you have a Bible or you can follow along, we'll have the text on the screen for you. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you one as you leave today. There's some on the back table. That's our gift to you. We're a Bible church, and we want you to, to have a copy of, of God's Word. You can also pull it up on your device. Uh, we'll be in Mark 15. But before we get to Mark 15, I want to give you a little, little background in the book of Leviticus. And before you leave, because I said Leviticus, uh, if you signed up to do the Bible reading in a year, and you start January 1st, and you start with Genesis chapter 1, you're about now you're in the book of Leviticus and you're ready to give up and quit. Because Leviticus is a really tough book to read through. There's all these laws and rules and it's really difficult to understand and comprehend. But I just want to zero in on one chapter, Leviticus 16. You don't need to turn there. I'll set the stage for you. There's the one day of the nation of Israel called the Day of Atonement. Today it's called Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. And one day God told Aaron, the chief, the high priest, said, this is how I want you to do and perform the Day of Atonement. Before you enter into the very special place of the temple, before you enter, enter into the Holy of Holies, this is, I want you to take a bath. Got to make sure you're clean. This is what I want you to wear. There's all these steps before you enter into that Holy of Holies. You're not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies on any other day of the year, but except the seventh day of the tenth month of the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur, the one day of atonement. And he's going to enter into that, and he's going to offer up a sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel, right? This is symbolic. The sacrifices that existed in the Old Testament were symbolic. We're pointing towards something bigger. We're pointing towards something greater. It was symbolic. And so part of the explanation they said, you're, you're going to sacrifice rams and goats and different things. But I want you specifically, Aaron, I want you to take two goats. And they're going to be male goats. And I want, you, I want them to look as, as close as they possibly can to each other. And both of them have as few blemishes as possible. So male goats, they look good. All right, got that. And you take two of them. And I want you to pull out some dice. You're going to roll some dice. And the dice is going to tell you what we do with each goat. With one goat, you're going to sacrifice, and you're going to place the, the blood over the, the doorposts. And that that's, goat's going to give, give its life. And then here's what I want you to do with the second goat. Leviticus chapter 16. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Now, of the two goats, you'd rather, you'd want to be this goat, right? There was the goat that was sacrificed, and then there's the live goat. And Aaron shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. So he places both hands. And they're going to place all the sins and all the transgressions and of the entire nation on this one goat. Place it on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So there's a servant. The servant's been identified. Servant, you're going to take this goat. After we place all the sins of the nation of Israel on this goat, and you're going to walk it out of town. Because if you just let it loose, it probably won't leave. It'd probably keep hanging around. So it's said that this man took this goat 10 miles. And every mile, there was a place to stop for water. And after 10 miles, they felt good that they would never, ever see this goat again. This goat is gone. This is not a goat you want coming back to camp. It's gone. And it tells us, this is a symbolism of what God's telling the nation of Israel, what he's going to do with their sin. What's he going to do with their sin? He's going to send it as far away as the east is from the west. The book of Psalms tells us. As, as deep as the ocean is, that's how far God has removed our sins. 
And so this is the called, this is called the escape goat. The escape goat was allowed to live, but walked, walked away. Maybe you've heard the phrase in our culture called the scapegoat, right? Who we're going to blame after the football team loses. We blame the kicker, right? Because they missed the kick. The kicker becomes what? The scapegoat. Even though the kicker only played like 30 seconds of the entire game, we're going to blame everything on that kicker because he missed the kick. That's how we got the, the term scapegoat in our society. It's actually from Leviticus 16, the scapegoat. We're going to put all the blame and all the shame on this goat, and it's going to be removed forever, never to be seen from again. And ultimately, this is a picture of what God wants to do with my sin and your sin, that it would be removed as far as the east is from the west, never to be seen again, never to show up in your life again, to give you guilt and to give you shame and to make you feel bad about the things that you've done in the past. It's removed. And all of this is symbolic, pointing towards something greater. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith, by looking ahead. Boulder Mountain today in 2024 were saved by looking at what happened in the past. And that brings us to Mark chapter 15 today. Mark chapter 15, verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. There was a scam of a trial that took place during the night, which directly went against Mosaic law. You were not to have trials at night. The first injustice of Jesus. They bound him. They brought him before Pilate. In verse 2, Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? The chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the high priests wanted Pilate to understand that Jesus was claiming to be the king of the Jews. Why, why a king? Because that's political. And maybe if they present Jesus as king of the Jews to Pilate, then he would, he would want to squelch that. But prophecy tells us about Jesus in Psalm 2, 2 that Jesus is ultimately from the throne of David, and he is the king of the Jews. And Pilate asks him, and he answered him, You have said so, the only words Jesus says in his trial. You have said so. It is, it is true. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring up against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. In the trial of Jesus, at least six injustices that he, was, that he went through. He had no defense. There was no evidence presented against him. There were false accusations. He was abused. Abused of the accused that went against Mosaic law to beat him. There was an improper timing. I mentioned that it was during the night. It wasn't allowed to be during the night. And there was bribery involved in this trial as well. My friends, if you feel like you're being treated unjustly, you're in really good company. Jesus knows what it's like to be accused unjustly and to, and to hold his mouth and to hold his tongue. And he didn't cry out and say, this isn't fair, and this is, I can't believe that you're, you're doing this to me. He, like a sheep, was led before slaughter. Isaiah 53 says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus, even in his silence, is working. As he stands before Pilate, he brings Rome to its knees. The same is true today. Sometimes we equate the silence of Jesus as he doesn't care for me, as he doesn't understand what I'm going through. Jesus is, is silent in this situation, in this prayer that I've been seeking an answer for. I'm in this circumstance, and Jesus, you're silent, but his silence does not mean he is not present Jesus was fully present there, standing before Pilate. He was standing before the crowd of people. They all saw him. His, his silence didn't mean his absence. 
And I just want to give you hope today that whatever you're sensing, the silence of Jesus in your life does not mean he is not working behind the scenes. He brings redemption to the entire world through his silence. Are you kidding me? He brings something that was meant for in great evil. We just sang about that. And he turns, it, he turns it for good. What seems like right now today is evil. You don't know. God could be using that and he can use that. He can use that for good. He stands before the people. He stands before uh, a few R words today, if you're taking notes. The first word I have down is Rome. Rome, Pilate represents Rome. How often do you think of the Roman Empire? Pilate is this very proud man. He's a crude man. He's a shrewd man. He's a people pleaser. He's superstitious. This is all the things that we've learned about Pilate. And he, very powerful man, he thinks he is making the decision here. Oh, how often we think we have power and we can make decisions when any influence that you and I have has been given to us by God. And that influence is here today and it can be taken away tomorrow. Pilate is being used by God in this, in this situation. Pilate ultimately comes to a very dangerous place. He becomes neutral to Jesus. And he listens to the case, and he becomes neutral. The only thing more dangerous than being neutral to Jesus is being indifferent to Jesus. Well, I, I don't care. You know, it sounds like he's, he was a good man. He taught, did a lot of nice things. He taught. He was a good man. You, you, you cannot land at that conclusion of who Jesus is. And Pilate, he stands there, and he asks, he asks a number of questions. He knew enough to make a decision. And many people in our community, they're indifferent to who Jesus is. And Pilate puts Jesus off until it's convenient. He knows enough to make a decision, but he defaults to the crowd. He defaults to others. So you have, you have Rome. In the next group, you have rabble-rousers. That's the crowd in the crowd, who, who's made up in the crowd that were watching and witnessing all of this? And Pilate's asking them questions. Now, in the past, I used to think the crowd that cried Hosanna when Jesus entered Jerusalem, and, and maybe you've heard this and thought about this, it's the same crowd there a week later crying crucify him. And I, I think there might have been some of the same people. So hear me, there were probably some of the same people, but I think it's a very overall a very different crowd of people. You have Galileans saying, as Jesus, as Jesus came in, you know, save us. He's the king. Save us. Hosanna in the highest. Pray for us. Save us. And then a week later, there's a, there's a different crowd saying, saying, crucify him. But you have the crowd. And even the crowd's voice, God is using we, we read this passage, we, we hear the voice of the crowd, but, but beyond, be, behind the curtain is really the voice of God. Because nothing is happening in Mark 15 that God is not orchestrating and ordaining in His providence and in His sovereignty for His glory. And the same is true in your life. God is using the events and the experiences of your life as, as difficult as they have been in your life, you think of things that have happened in your life that are horrendous and they're awful, decisions that have been, been done to you and decisions that you have made, and only God can redeem that. I used to say, I used to use the word redeem in my own personal vocabulary, and I realized, no, I don't redeem anything. Well, I'm going to redeem that situation. And I realized I can't redeem anything. Jesus redeems. Maybe we can reclaim some things, but there's only one who truly redeems and his name is Jesus. Anything that is broken in your life, Jesus can redeem that. You can't redeem it. Jesus will redeem it. In verse 6 of Mark 15, Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. This is Pilate. This was not 
the law. This did not come from the Old Testament. This was just a tradition that they would do. At, at Passover, they would release one prisoner. Now, we would, we would riot in the streets if that happened today, right? If, if they release prisoners from, from jail, the worst of the worst, just release them into, into society, there'd be some protesting on that. But they're going to release one prisoner for whom they ask, and the, the crowd gets to make the decision. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Now, what's interesting to note, I believe there's only six characters that are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who make all four Gospels. Uh, Mary, Mary is one of them, uh, the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is one of them. Uh, Pilate is one of them. Jesus is one of them. Uh, Barabbas makes all four books. This, this man named, named Barabbas, who is introduced here in Mark, Mark 15. There's a man called Barabbas. Now, why is his name Barabbas? This is interesting. There's a, there's a point Jesus calls Simon Peter. In Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus calls Simon Peter Bar-Jonah. Bar, Greek, son of. Jonas, son of Jonas. Peter, you're the son of Jonas. Kyle, I'm the son of Chuck. Charles this is my, my dad's name. Bar Chuck would be my, my name, my last name. You fill in the blank. What's your last name, right? Why is he called Barabbas? Abbas means father. Have you ever heard of Abba, father? When Jesus prays to his father, he says, Abba, father, right? Barabbas, the son of the father, Lowercase f, the son of the earthly father, the son of the world, Barabbas. Now, why is he called last name? Last names are a big deal, especially if you play sports. Anybody who ever played high school or college sports, you don't wear your first name on your back of your jersey. You wear your last name, right? But because his first name, Barabbas' first name is Jesus. It's a common name. Jesus. Release Jesus. This is, this is important. Because if they said release Jesus, that'd be confusing if you were Pilate. Like, I got Jesus on my right, I got Jesus on my left. So who are you talking about here? Barabbas. We're going to call him by his last name. Barabbas. And he's a bad dude. He was what we would consider a terrorist. Modern day terrorist causing problems and creating insurrections and different gospels. Remember, he makes it in all four gospels. Had a lot to say about Bravis, a thief, a crook, a robber, a murderer, just rebellious. And who do they want released? There was a man called Brabus, and the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Now Pilate's thinking, I'm sure the crowd is going to want me to release Jesus. There's so much more evidence against Barabbas and his fellow buddies, his other two pals. And so Pilate's thinking, this is a slam dunk. They're certainly going to choose, choose Jesus. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up, which he was correct. There was envy. But the, thief, the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him released for them, Barabbas instead, and Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having them scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. One of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis. It came out 35 years ago. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it for you because if you haven't seen it by now, you probably aren't going to see it. But there's a the most incredible ending of that movie. It's, it's a story of redemption. It, it's a story of my life for you. You got three characters. You got Cora, who's the daughter of an English soldier. You've got Hawkeye, who is a Yankee but was identifying with the Mohican tribe. And then you have Duncan, who's an English soldier. And Duncan is translating before the 
Indian chief. And what they're going to do, they're going to burn Korah at the stake. And Hawkeye, who's her long, eternal love, says, I will sacrifice my life for Korah. He says, take me, don't take her, take me. And he's telling Duncan, translate, translate to take Hawkeye, to take me. And Duncan, as a great act of sacrifice and love and redemption, says to the chief, no, take me, meaning Duncan. And they end up, they run up and they grab Duncan and Hawkeye and Korah run off up into the mountains. It's a powerful scene, but it's, Jesus says in this passage, take me. Now, he doesn't speak it, but what is happening in this scene is Barabbas is being set free. So let me give you the background here. Barabbas wakes up in the morning. He wakes up that morning in a cell. He knows that there is a cross waiting for him, probably with his name on it already. It was him and his two, two buddies who were murderers and thieves and crooks and robbers. There were three crosses ready, for, and one of them, the center one, was for Barabbas. He wakes up that day. He's in shackles on his ankles and on his wrists. There are, there's chains around him. He wakes up and he hears. Maybe he's there, maybe he's not. Maybe he's being led there and he hears Barabbas, Barabbas. And then the, he also hears crucify him. You put that together. If that were you and you heard your name and you heard the phrase crucify, you're thinking this is it. He, he knows the fate that awaits him as he heads to the trial. And then Pilate probably brings him up. And he's got Barabbas on his right and Jesus on his left, as I'm imagining the scene. He's asking the crowd. And Pilate, I think, as I read this story, this is complete blasphemy, what is happening here. For sure, Barabbas deserves the death. He's a terrorist. He's taken the lives of innocent people. He's stolen from people. He's, he's made a lot of people victims in his world. He deserves it. That's easy for me to say, put Barabbas to death. Put him, lock him up. He'd throw the key away. Lock him up. Barabbas is a bad man. And we would all recognize that. There have been people in our life who've hurt us and done us damage. Like, they deserve justice. What has Jesus done? Jesus. You got the son of the earthly father here, and you have the son of God on his other side. What has Jesus done? What is he being accused of? He has made the blind see. He has caused the lame to walk. He has healed the leper. He has raised Lazarus from the dead. He has forgiven his enemies. He taught a new way and he offers eternal life. What has Jesus done? And these are the two options. And as I read this story, I often think, and as you read the passage, a good question to ask is, who am I in the story? Am I Pilate in this story? What am I going to do with Jesus? Maybe at some times, am I the crowd in the story? At times, yes, I'm part of the crowd. But more than anything in this, in this story, my friend, I find myself, who am I in the story? I am Barabbas. I deserve punishment, and I deserve chains, and I deserve a death based upon my life. I have lived a selfish and a very proud life. And what is happening in the story between Jesus and Barabbas why and how is Barabbas set free? He's there in shackles. Did Barabbas set himself free? Barabbas did nothing. And the Roman soldier takes the key and he walks up to him and he begins to unlock the chains from his wrists and, his, and he says, you, you are free to go. Barabbas didn't do anything. And some of us in the room, we've got addictions and we've got marital problems and we have debt and we have all these problems in our life. And they, Well, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do better. I can solve this on my own. There's, there's nothing you can do to redeem your life. Only Jesus redeems. Why is Barabbas and how is Barabbas set free? Because of the love of the Father for Barabbas. You see, I don't know the end of the story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not tell us how the story ends with Barabbas. I don't know if he's kept walking away from the cross and he just kept going. I don't know if he stopped and turned around and really recognized what was happening, that he was experiencing freedom. There are prisoners all across our country. There are men who are coming to faith in prisons at a ridiculous rate. One day they're going to be set free. If not on this side, one day they're going to be set free and their chains are going to fall off of them. That's a powerful thing. 
They're, they're paying the time for their, the consequences of their, of their sin on, on this side. But one day they're going to be set free. Barabbas experienced it in the moment. He was a murderer. He didn't pay any of his time. And he's walking free. And I, I, I kind of have a dream. Now, this is extra. This is not in the passage. This is just Kyle's thoughts. I, I wonder if we're going to see Barabbas in heaven. What do you think? Do you think maybe, maybe he realized it? I don't know if God softened his heart or if he went on to continue to murder, steal, and be a criminal the rest of his life. I don't know. Did he go back to the cross and see his two buddies hanging there? The two on the other side of Jesus were his friends. They were the other part of his group, his posse that he hung with. They were insurrectionists as well. And did he look up and did he hear one of them give his faith to Jesus and say, Today, Jesus say to him, Today you will be with me in paradise? I don't know the end of the story of Barabbas. I wonder. But what's fascinating is he wasn't set free based upon his faith in Jesus. What set him free was the love of the Father. Jesus loves Barabbas. Jesus loves Barabbas. And Jesus loves you. And if you were on that stage, Jesus would have said, my life for you. Let me, let me take those shackles off. And some of us stand there and we, we don't want to be set free. We're like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the shame and the guilt that I've experienced in my life. Let me solve this on my own. The only, the only way we can be redeemed is when when Jesus says, my life for you, I will go to the cross. In order, in order for Barabbas to be treated like Jesus, God had to treat Jesus like Barabbas. And, and Barabbas might be the only person who doesn't just say, Jesus paid the price for my sins, but Barabbas says, Jesus literally took my place. He took my cross that had my name on it. And he went. And he carried the cross that I was supposed to be carrying. He woke up that day thinking he was going to the cross. Instead, he's walking outside town. I don't know if he kept walking. I don't know if he went back to the cross. I don't know if he came to faith. There's a lot of characters in the Gospels that we thought, there's no way that God's going to turn their heart around. And he, they do. Last week, we talked about the religious leaders. Some of them in the book of Acts give their life to Jesus. First week, we talked about Thomas. Thomas was a skeptic. He gives his life to Jesus. There's secret disciples, Nicodemus. We've looked at Nicodemus this past year. Nicodemus ends up being part of the, the burial. He shows up. Jesus changes everything. I don't know where you're at in life, but it is not too late for Jesus to do a significant work in your life and to redeem your story. You're like, oh, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand the shame that I've caused to people in, in my life, my story. And Jesus says, let me take your shame. Oh, but you don't know. I might do this again. He says, I'll still be here if you do it again. What released Barabbas from his chains was the love of the Father. What releases and what saves us is the love of the Father. And what did Barabbas do? Nothing. He did nothing. A few weeks ago when we were walking through the story of Hosea, what did Gomer do? She did nothing. What did I do? I, I, nothing. I simply receive the love that, and grace and mercy that God has offered me. And with that, I, I walk a free man. What set Barabbas free? The love of the Father. And who is Barabbas in the story? It's me. Jesus says, I love Barabbas. I wanted Barabbas to go free. But you don't know what he was going to do afterwards. I still love him. Jesus was, he was treated unjustly, and he didn't, he didn't lash out. A murderer is set free, and Jesus goes to the cross. The silence of Jesus, the indifference toward Jesus, and the sacrifice for all of Jesus, for God so loved the world, that includes you, my friend, it includes everybody in your circle that you, you've never met a person. You've never met a person, even though if you've been mistreated or you're being taken advantage of or some awful things that have happened to you, you've never met a person that God does not love. And God 
did not send his son to die for. You see, Jesus gets what you and I deserve. And you get what he deserves. It's the greatest exchange in all of history. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for all. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The whole Old Testament, the sacrificial system, was all symbolic, pointing toward the one sacrifice for all. And that sacrifice, my friend, is, is permanent for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Pilate originally thought if we put Judas to death, we'll end a revolution. It'll squelch that small little revolution rebellion. What he didn't understand, you put Jesus to death and you'll start the greatest revolution mission the world has ever known called the church. Jesus. They nailed him to a cross. They buried him. They put a stone over his grave. They wiped their hands and they said, there's no one, no one, this radical will never disturb us again. And three days later, Jesus pulled off one of the greatest coup of all time. He got up out of the grave and he started, he's the leader of a new creation. And you, my friends, can be part of that new creation by recognizing and receiving the sacrifice that Jesus gave on your behalf. You've been set free. You've been set free by, by the true Jesus. We're all Barabbas. Every one of us, we can relate to Barabbas. And if you've not received that grace and mercy that Jesus so freely offers you, today you can receive and experience redemption. See, every movie, every book that's ever been written, they all have a redemption story but they all fall so short of the greatest redemption story, the, the gospel. Would you pray with me this morning? And Father, I thank you that, I thank you for Barabbas, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all thought it worthwhile to include him, include this story. And I pray for all of us in this room that we would make a decision about Jesus, that we wouldn't be indifferent and we wouldn't be neutral we would make a decision about what are we going to do with Jesus. Are we, going to, are we going to walk away free? Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are the King of the kings and Lord of lords. And one day every nation, every king, every emperor, every nation will bow, bow down and worship before you. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment. And let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.